look, it's not just about the amount of time you put into training or the amount of you know, years you put into training. It really is about the quality. Hey, what's going on? This is episode 374. It's Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I'm Jeremy Lesniak. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Sensei Liam Murphy. If you want to find everything that we do, the best place to go is whistlekick.com, and you can save 15%. If you want to hook yourself up or maybe just support us, use the code PODCAST15, gets you 15% off. Everything for this show, including photos, video, transcripts, all the other episodes, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, 100% for free, because that's what we do. We give away all the good stuff and hope that maybe someday you'll give something back to us. That's our business model. We like it. It's friendlier rather than putting a paywall up on all the good stuff. Now, today's guest is a diehard karateka, karate practitioner. Sensei Murphy is steeped in Shotokan. And you may guess from the name, he is of Irish descent. In fact, he lives in Ireland. And if we dig really far back, we're pretty sure that we're related. I've got, I've got some Murphy blood running through me. But that's not what we talked about. We talked about martial arts. We talked about how it's changed his life, and where it's taking him. So, sit back, or don't if you're standing somewhere. Have a listen, and hear his story. Sensei Murphy, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me, Jeremy. It's a pleasure to have you. And as we were just talking about, folks, you know, one of the things that that I don't talk about on the show too much is is my history, my, my lineage. But um, I, I have some Murphys in my past as well. And, and sounds like if we were to really track it back, I think we could, we could probably prove out that we were related in some small way. Probably somewhere <laughs> along the line. Yeah, probably. We'll have to do a DNA test when all this is over. Absolutely. Love it. Be the first DNA test conducted <laughs> for, for martial arts purposes, at least on this show, if not, if not anywhere. That's it. We can do a live reveal. <laughs> That'd be fun. Well, uh, as much fun as that would be, probably much more so for you and I than the folks listening. So let's talk about <laughs> a little bit more fun to the broader public, and that's martial arts. And specifically, how'd you start? Yeah, it's funny. I, I just kind of stumbled into martial arts, really, um, probably both literally and figuratively. I, I don't have a story about you know being being bullied when I was a kid or seeing a Bruce Lee movie that inspired me to go and, and join a martial arts club or anything like that. Um, I, I really did just kind of join a club out of curiosity to see to see what it was like. Um, and I was lucky, I guess, in that the, the instructor there, Joe Sweetman, who's now fifth down with the JK and still very much in touch with him, uh, was a really good instructor, very open. And um, I just kind of liked what I liked what I saw and, and, and kept going. Um, I guess the more Interesting question in some ways, um, you know, people start martial arts for, for all different reasons, whether it's because they're bullied and they want to defend themselves or because they, they want to compete or because they want to get fit or because there's nothing good on TV on a Tuesday night and they want to get out of the house. But I think what's really interesting sometimes is why people continue training in the martial arts. So after the first few sessions when, you know, they realize, hey, this is, this is a little bit difficult and they realize that they... Um, you know, they have to put some effort in and there might be some sacrifices involved. Why do people continue training beyond that initial, oh, I, I went along because I saw a movie or I went along because my friends were going. Um, and for me, the reason I, I guess I continued training rather than just, as I said, kind of stumble into a dojo. Um, originally, I, I liked the, the, the feel of the movements in that when you're playing football or basketball or badminton or whatever, your, your body tends to move in a certain way and you get quite used to that. But suddenly when you're in a karate class or a martial arts class, your, your body has been challenged to, to move in different ways that it's never experienced before and to expand in different ways and rotate and spin and turn and pivot. And that kind of new physical expression, I, I just really, really like the feel of. And I think that kind of brought me along to a certain point. Um, and then after that, I realized, hey, the, the more you practice at this, you, the, the, the better you get. And there was a very close, very ob- obvious correlation between, hey, if you put in the practice, you're, you're going to improve. And martial arts in particular, I think, have a very structured way of, of helping you to improve in that there's a particular kick. And if you want to you know, do the kick well, you lift your knee here, you pivot on your foot, you extend your hips, and, and suddenly the kick starts working. And if the kick's not working, you figure out, oh, I've got to lift my knee more, I've got to pivot more. So it gives you a very clear way of improving your techniques. 
Um, and that appealed to me as well. So if I saw I wasn't doing something well, I was able to analyze it, break it down, look at the instruction, figure out how to do it, train more, and hey, presto, you start to improve little by little. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's kind of, as I said, I, I don't have an inspiring story about, about getting into martial arts, but definitely there were things about it that appealed to me to continue training, if that makes sense. It, it sure does. And while we certainly have some inspiring stories that have come on this show that that you know were those those the impetus for people training you know dramatic events and bullying and whatnot those aren't the majority at least in my experience mm. so i think when someone talks about you know a more run-of-the-mill interest and then kind of shifting that question from why did you start to why did you continue i think that makes a lot of sense because let's face it a lot of people try martial arts very few stick with it mm. and i think what's interesting is um, the reason that people continue training is usually very different to the reason why they, they started training. Mm -hmm. So they, they may have started training because they just wanted to get in physical shape and then suddenly they realized, oh, hold on, there's competitions here. These competitions are kind of fun. Or maybe they started because they wanted to compete and then after a while they realized, hold, hold, hold on, there's kind of real self-defense applications to some of these kata moves. This is kind of interesting. And then that's why they continue training. And for me, that's one of the things that, that's really interesting about karate is that there's so many different aspects to it that if you find yourself getting a little bit bored with, with a particular aspect, there's always something else that you can look at. There's always some, you know, if you're, you, you're, you're getting a little bit bored with the competitive end of things, you can start looking at it from the physical expression perspective or the, the physical well-being perspective or the, the self-defense perspective. And if that starts to get a little bit bored, you, bored um, to, you, you, you can look at it from a, a different angle. So it's that continually kind of evolving journey, I think, is, is what's really interesting and why people continue rather than just why they start. Mm. I wholeheartedly agree. And when you talk about the different w things that you can train, you know, whether you're talking about training for competition or training for self-defense, if you were to make a list of all of those things, and then if you were to make a list of all of the ways that you could train for those things, it blows my mind that people ever say that they are bored in martial arts. Abs absolutely, totally agree with you. And, and from an, uh, um, the point of view of an instructor, um, you, you're, never stuck, you're never stuck for something to teach because there's so much out there to, to um, expose students to. There's so much yes. out there to, to keep them interested. And yeah. so, as you said, so many different ways, there's so many different channels and then so many different approaches to each of those channels. The, 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 the possibilities are, are, are endless. They are. And you know, as, as much as I kind of poke at the folks who say I'm bored with their training, I think a lot of that comes back to the instructor. And as an instructor, I'm curious your thoughts on this. I've seen a lot of instructors, unfortunately, I've trained with some of them who know how to teach a few things in only one way each. Mm. And they become bored and thus the students become bored. Yeah. And I, I think that can work if you happen to strike a chord with a student and you're on the same wavelength as a student and they pick it up very quickly. But if the student isn't picking it up, they need a different way. They need it explained to them in a different way or they need it broken down in a different way. And I, and I think that's what a good instructor can do, that they can break down a technique in such a way that it appeals to how a student um, is going to respond, is, is going to be most receptive to it, as opposed to this is how I teach it, so this is how you have to learn it. It should be a case of, well, how, how are you going to learn it? And then I'll try to figure out a way of presenting it to you that you can, you can take it on board and work with it. Right. What is the job of the instructor? It's to share that knowledge. It's not the job of the student to come in and learn. Um, I th yeah. But, but there's I a responsibility. It, it, exactly. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think there's a responsibility on the, on the student's part to, to be receptive and to, to try their best and to take on board what the instructor yes. is saying. Um, but I do think also, as you said, there is a responsibility on the instructor to be aware that not every student is going to pick things up the, the exact same way. Not every student is going to be physically talented enough to see what the instructor is doing and uh, immediately replicate it. Mm. Totally agree. Now, let's go back a minute. You talked about the contrast between your early martial arts training and what I would call more conventional sports. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in those more conventional sports and, and finding something was missing? You know, what's the... Um, I, I would have been involved in kind of organized sports probably up to kind of early teenage years. And, and then 
would have continued, but on a more casual basis. So it would have been, you know, kind of playing football with friends on a Saturday afternoon rather than getting heavily involved in, in organized leagues and, and that kind of thing. And sorry, by football, I mean, I mean, soccer. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think most of us in America, when we hear an accent such as yours, <laughs> we hear football, we, we translate automatically. At least I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably guessed I wasn't talking about what I'd refer to as, as American football. Um, but yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, other, other sports, I would have played a little bit of basketball at school and, and, and so on. Uh, you know, a little bit of athletics. But there was nothing there that really, um, really captured my imagination, I suppose you'd say. Mm. Okay. And, and I find that that's pretty common. You know, I, I, I enjoyed other sports, but especially the team dynamic, you mm. know, just never really jived for me. And, you know, for, I haven't said this on the show in a while, but longtime listeners might, might roll their eyes. They've heard this quite a few times. What I found in martial arts was that it gave back what I put in. And I hadn't found anything else up until that time that did that. Yeah, I, I, exactly. That's something kind of I, I alluded to a little bit earlier when I was saying I suddenly realized, hey, you know, you, you practice at this and you get better. And there's a structure to how you practice in order to get better. Right. Um, so it was that very direct correlation between the effort you put in and the, the product you see at the end. I think that's what kind of definitely one of the things that attracted me to it. Nice. All right. Now we've got a bit of context for you. We've, we've got your, your early days we, we know a bit about how you look at martial arts and look at the world let's talk about stories story time if you will because that's my favorite part of martial arts radio is getting people to tell their stories sure so if i was to ask you for your favorite story what would that be yeah um you know there's one i'll, I'll be honest i wasn't there um and i'm kind of glad i wasn't there because i'd imagine it was a kind of you know a, a, an awkward silence at the end of it but um my um, there was a, a very senior Japanese instructor visiting a, a bunch of clubs here. And after training, they'd gone out for dinner with some of the, the local club instructors. And the Japanese instructor said to, to one of the local guys who was quite proud of his kata, uh, he asked him, you know, what's your favorite kata? So he answered with whatever it was, sochen. And the Japanese instructor said, ah, sochen, sochen. And, and how long have you been practicing it? And he very proudly said, for, for 10 years, sensei. And he goes, ah, oh, for 10 years. And, and how often do you practice it? And he goes, ah, oh, every day, sensei. And the Japanese instructor went, ah, oh, every day. So every day for 10 years, you've been practicing Sochin wrong. <laughs> and as you can imagine, there was a combination of tumbleweed, crickets, people looking at their watches, looking at the ceiling, looking at the floor. Um, but the, the reason I, I, I like that little, little anecdote is because it really strikes home that, look, it's not just about you know, the, the amount of time you put into training or the amount of, you know, years you put into training, it really is about the, the quality and the, the thought that you put into what you're doing, as opposed to just turning up and training and going home and turning up again and training and going home. You, you really improve by, by being more thoughtful and more present in your, in, your, in your training than that. And it's like, you know, they say, you know, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. It's perfect practice makes perfect. Um, but, but sometimes people just, throw volume at their training and, and assume it's going to take them somewhere, but it's got to be volume plus quality. That's what's going to, going to move you forward. Absolutely. That, that's such a beautiful story, a beautiful anecdote. And I, I've got a feeling that we may have ruffled a few feathers there and I'm quite okay <laughs> with that, but I'm also thinking that we may have turned on even more light bulbs. So I'm mm. hopeful. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, I always say whenever I'm teaching a class, I, I, I always say, I, I honestly don't mind if you, if you don't agree with me. If I'm, if I'm saying something and I'm teaching something, I'm trying to explain a concept and you don't agree with me, I'm 100% okay with that. But what I do want you to do is think about it. So if you don't agree with me, that's absolutely fine. But I'd like you to be able to say, you know, I don't agree with you because I think it should be done this way. And now it means you're thinking. And, and, and that's kind of my objective as an instructor is to get you to think, not necessarily just to copy what I'm doing. I wish everyone felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's a good story. Did you say there was more than one? Um, no, that's just one that okay. springs to mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and another little one, it's um, when I was training, and maybe it shows kind of some cultural differences. When I was training in Japan one time, um, and uh, we, we were doing a line out, there was lots of movement going on, and one of the guys um, accidentally made contact with his opponent and 
bust his knuckles on his on his teeth. Uh, nothing major, just kind of cut across his knuckles. But he continued training and he continued in the line out. And um, it, it meant that everybody who he partnered then he was accidentally smearing with blood. Ugh from his knuckles so by the end of the class and it wasn't a particularly tough class it was just this guy was bleeding all over the place and at the end of the class we looked around and it looked as if there was a bloodbath everybody was covered um, so he, he stood up in front of the class realized what had happened bowed very apologetically and offered to launder everybody's suit for them. <laughs> but um, no, no, nobody took him up on the offer but I was just wondering if that were to happen in a class here, um, I doubt if the, the guilty party would be offering to, to wash anybody's suit. Probably not. I mean, it, <laughs> for, first off, in at least in the United States, it tends to be that, that the moment blood pops up, you know, that person is removed from the training floor because of concerns with bloodborne illness. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. Even, even, for, even moving past that, even if I remember back to my earlier days of, of training, um, you know, people would become apprehensive because they didn't want to have to put that much extra time into cleaning their, their gi. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, at the time it was, it was, as I said, it was a young guy and he was excitable and he, he just kept going and he didn't kind of realize what happened until the end of the class. <laughs> it's good stuff. Now, how about outside of martial arts? I mean, is there, are there things that, that you engage in, things that you're passionate about? You know, um, not really, no, anything else that I engage in outside of martial arts, I do it on a very kind of casual basis just to, to relax, to chill, to, to not think about it. Um, if I were to start thinking about something, it would, it would start, to be, um, start to be less fun, if you like. So kind of martial arts, I, I, I put a lot of energy, a lot of effort into it, and then everything else is just kind of, yeah, I can take it or leave it. Get that. Now, one of my favorite things to talk to people about are the ways that martial arts has helped them in their lives. And, and I don't just mean in, you know, giving you some exercise and, and maybe a, a group of people to, to socialize with or, mm. or, or things to, to challenge you, because I think yeah. we all need challenges. But I'm always interested in the way people take martial arts out into the real world. Mm. So if I was to ask you about a time in life where maybe things weren't going so well and you had to use something that you learned in martial arts, be it physical or non-physical yeah, yeah, to move through that challenge. What would that be? What would that story be like? Sure. Um, I think it would probably come down to, to, to an attitude rather than a particular kind of a particular instant or a particular, uh, you know, incident or anything like that. And um, I'll, I'll just kind of put this in a little bit of context. Um, when I was in Japan, my, my the vice, I, I, I taught in a, in a high school there, and the vice principal of uh, school um, invited me around to his house for, for dinner one time to watch a football match with himself and his fun, son. And in the course of the conversation, um, it emerged that he came from old samurai, an, an old samurai family. And he was obviously very proud of this. And he started to give me a little bit of the, the, the family history. And it turns out that he was on um, the his family was on the losing side of some battle way back when, and they, they lost their samurai status. Um, but they had um, at the time an ornate sword in the family that they weren't willing to give up. Now, when they lost their samurai status, it meant that they they wouldn't have had the right to hold a sword. But they weren't prepared to give up this sword, so they hid it. Now, if the family were found hiding this sword, it would have been at the time it would have been it would have been executed. But they, they took this risk, and they continued to hide this sword and pass it on from generation to generation for hundreds of years. And it wasn't until um, I guess the the Meiji Restoration in the late 1800s, when the samurai class basically lost their privileges, that they were able to bring the sword out into the open again. And at that stage, it had been you know, in hiding for hundreds of years. And, and prior to that, it had been in the family for, for, for hundreds of years. Um, but now it was, it was out in the open again. And he, he sent his son upstairs to get the sword to show me. And he, he brought it down. It was in this beautiful, very plain wooden scabbard. And he clicked it open and he pulled the blade out. He showed me the blade. And then he showed me the certificate that authenticated its, its origin and its maker and how old it was and everything else. Uh, and he, he was showing it to me to, to, to explain his family heritage and how his family was steeped in this samurai heritage. Um, so we got to talking then about uh, Bushido and, and Budo. Um, 
and this was something that he, he was obviously part of his life given the, his, his family background and his samurai background and so on. And he started to explain what, what Budo and Bushido and the way of the warrior meant to him. Uh, and he was saying, look, a lot, a lot of people think it's very, um, it's very macho and it's, very, it's, it's associated with fighting and swords or it's very, very stoic and very serious. And he, he said, no, 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 what Budo means is whatever you're doing, when you're doing it, you give it 100%. And, and that's all it means. It doesn't matter what you're doing. When you're doing it, it takes 100% of your focus, 100% of your, your effort. And that's what Budo means. And I just thought that coming from him and given his, his, his background and his, his lineage and his understanding of his background and his lineage, that it was a very powerful explanation of, of, of what it actually meant. And it's something that I try to implement kind of in everyday life, that when I'm doing something now, and it, it's be, be becoming so much more difficult, I think, in everyday life to when you are doing something now to give it 100% because, you know, your, your phone is in your back pocket and you've got 15 alerts and you've got 14 browsers open on your, 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 your laptop or whatever. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to just when you're doing something, give it 100%. Even when you're talking to somebody, give that person 100% of your attention while you're talking to them. And that, that's the kind of the, the, the martial arts or the Budo attitude that I try to, to take into everything else. And obviously from a, a martial art, very direct martial arts perspective, you know, when you're fighting, you've got to make sure that you give everything 100%. You've got to make sure if you're attacking, you, you, you attack 100%. So it has a very obvious application there. But I think it has an equally valid application in everything else that you're doing in life, whether it's talking to somebody, working on a project, writing an email, whatever it is. While you're doing it, that's what you're doing 100%. And then I think, regardless of what happens after that, whether things go well or things go badly, you can look back and you can say, yep, yeah, gave it 100%, couldn't have done any more. And that gives you a certain degree of satisfaction as well. At least it should. It right? should. And, and, and there yes. are people who, who don't find that satisfaction. But I think knowing that you've given your all. You know, yeah. If, if you can look back. comfort in that. Definitely. And if you can look back, you know, doing well or doing badly, if you look back and go, you know what, I don't think I could have done anything else. There's a certain degree of solace in that, regardless if, if things go well or things, things go badly. But I think that's kind of a, a, a lesson from, uh, I'm sorry if I kind of, uh, somewhat circuitous route to, to, to get to the answer. Um, but that's something from kind of martial arts that was explained to me and that I try to apply in, in other aspects of, of life as well. Sure. Sure. Circuit, circuitous is just fine. That's good. Don't That's worry. good. Don't, don't <laughs> now, if, if you, here, here's kind of a hypothetical for you. If, yeah. if we were to roll back to, you know, those first few classes that you were training mm. and you didn't find what you wanted, you know, maybe you had a terrible instructor or, or for yeah, whatever reason yeah. it didn't work out. How do you think you'd be different now versus that? That's a, that's a re yeah, that's a really interesting question. And it's really difficult to answer because it's, Training has played such a vital role in everything that I've done since then. It's very difficult to step back and say, well, what, what would have been different? You know, would I have channeled my energies into something else? Um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I just would have gone home and sat on the sofa. Maybe I would have channeled those energies into some other physical activity. Um, maybe I would have channeled those energies into some professional activities. So it's, it's, it's really difficult to tell. Um, but... Uh, on the whole, I would hope that it's had a, a net positive impact on my, on my life. Well, I think it would be really hard for it not to. Mm. You know, I, I can't say that I've ever met someone whose life wasn't positively impacted. Yeah, yeah. Really and, and, and even if nothing else, you know, I've met great people along the way that I wouldn't have met otherwise. That's right. Now, one of those things that we haven't talked about are the people that you have trained with and, and currently train with. So. Mm. You know, you gave me a little bit of context for the environment that you're training in and how it might be a little bit different than what most folks are used to. So why don't you take a minute and tell us about your school and, and, and the organization? And Sure, yeah. So the, 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 do, the group that um, I belong to here, it's uh, JKA Shotokan Ireland, Japan Karate Association. Um, Shotokan Ireland. And we're one of the uh, representative branches of the, the JKA in Ireland. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization, so we, we don't have um, kind of a, a mass network of schools or clubs or anything like that. And everybody who's involved in it are, are involved 
Um, their, their long-time karate practitioners, generally they, they were all kind of fifth downs. We've all been training together for a very long time and continue to train because it's, it's what we, we love to do. We're not doing it because um, we're trying to take over the world or, or, or try to have a, a dojo on every, co every corner or anything like that. We're, we're doing it because it's something that we love doing and, and, and it's something that we want to pass on to, to other people as well. Um, so we're based in um, out of some of the main universities in, in Ireland, Dublin City University, University College Dublin, um, Maynooth University, just outside of Dublin. And then we'd have clubs in, in uh, various different kind of local community centres and so on. And one of our main clubs where we all come together is the, the YMCA in Dublin City Centre. And um, so if you come along there on a, you know on a, on a Thursday night, it'll be maybe you know five fifth dance, all training along with a bunch of other people, and um, sweating it out on a on a on a Thursday evening. And um, so that's kind of the the the, the club and the, the structure. As I said, we're aligned with um, Japan Karate Association (JKA) and our our main instructor is Kawazoi Sensei, who's a seventh dan, and he's based over in the UK. And we get to train with him a, a number of times a year. He comes over and, and trains with us, and we go over and train on his various international courses um, throughout, throughout Europe and so on. So that's kind of the, um, the lineage, if you like. But one of the things that, um, <clears throat> one of the things that has been a, a very important part of, of our training as a group is that we've always been very open to training with other instructors and, and other associations. And it's something, um, I, I mentioned my original instructor, Joe Sweetman, or I think I did, I should have if I didn't. Um, he, he was always very open to seeing what can be learned from other styles and other instructors, whether it's looking at, at Thai boxers and seeing how they generate more power as they, they pivot through kicks, or whether it's looking at um, Kobudo practitioners and seeing how they manipulate weapons, or whether it's looking at um, Okinawa, Okinawan practitioners and seeing how they apply kata moves and so on. So, so looking at all of these different instructors and different styles and seeing what we can take from those and incorporate into our own into our own training, even though our own training is still very much focused on the, the, the Shotokan lineage, if you like. So even though we do follow that uh, Shotokan lineage, I think we're, we're all very open to taking those influences to, to augment and to support what we're doing. Cool. Now, how much of who you are as a martial artist today is from, you know, this, this, and, and I heard the name, but names don't click well for me. So th this gentleman, the seventh Don versus, you know, other people along the way. Sure. You know, it, that, that's interesting because when you, when you ask people who are their biggest influences in terms of their martial arts development. They'll very often say, they'll mention a seventh an or an eighth an or a tenth an or, or somebody who's the, the head of their, their group or their, their lineage or whatever. And that's obviously going to play a very important part. And for me, it, it, it does definitely. Um, but I also think, realistically, the people who influence who you are as a, as, a, as a martial artist and your standard and your level as a martial artist, it's the people who you train with week in, week out in your dojo. They're the ones who you're, you're pacing yourself against. They're the ones who you're, you're pitting yourself against. They're the ones who um, you're trying to get the better of and you're, you're getting ideas from and you're swapping ideas with. Um, so I, I really think your development as, um, or the, the greatest influence in your development as a martial artist is really the, the people who you see in your dojo week in, week out. Um, so that, that, that would be my opinion. Obviously, as I said, Kawazoi Sensei, he, one of the, the reasons that he, for me, is, is such an inspiration is because he's now into his 70s and he's still moving and, and, and kicking like somebody, you know, 40 years his junior. And that, for me, is down to his, his attention to technique um, and that his attention to technique allows him to continue practicing at such a high level, at such an advanced age. Um, and he, he's just one, he's obviously a, a, an important factor, but we, along the way, I would have, and everybody else in the group would have trained with a, you know, a number of other instructors, and we would have got something from 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 each of those, whether, um, you know, whether it's a particular technique or a particular way of training or or a particular understanding of a kata or or a particular approach to training kata or whatever. Interesting. And let's kind of flip that question on its head. You've probably heard me ask this one before. Who would you want to train with? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it tells us a lot about where people feel their not only their strengths lie, but also their their potential deficiencies. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's funny, the, the martial arts world is such now that if there was somebody somewhere who you really wanted to train with, you, you probably could. Probably you could, could yeah. You know, it, it might mean hopping on a plane and flying to another continent or another country, but if there was somebody out there who, who you really thought you, you, you could learn from, there's an avenue to get to them. Um, so for that reason, I'm not going to say anybody living, because if I were to say somebody living, some smart aleck is going to go, well, you know where he lives, just go train with him. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go for the dead option here. Um, and as a Shotokan practitioner, I guess the, the obvious dead option would be uh, Funakoshi. Um, but I, I'm going to go a step beyond that. I'm going to go one step back. And, and one of his instructors, uh, Anko Itosu, who was accredited with uh, having developed the Hain Katas, and the Hain Katas or the Pinan Katas, <clears throat> They form such a, a vital part of the Shotokan, um, Shotokan karate and one's development in Shotokan karate. And the, the reason I want to bypass Funakoshi on this one is because from a little bit of reading, I understood that even though Funakoshi was his student, he didn't actually learn the hand katas from him, that he had stopped training with him when he developed the hand katas and that Funakoshi actually learned the hand katas from an intermediary. Um, rather than from his, his original instructor who, who had developed them. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to train with him just to see what exactly he was thinking when he developed the hand cartas, what his objectives were, what he was trying to, trying to teach, what he was trying to convey, or what he was trying to hide in, in developing the five cartas that would then go on and be taught for kind of, a, you know, a, a, yeah. another hundred odd years. Right. And is that what he had intended for, for, for the hand cartas? Maybe we were... We're, we're practicing them now in a way that he never intended them to be, to be practiced. So I think it'll be really interesting just to see what his thought process was in, in, in kind of codifying the, the moves of those kata. Mm. And it's such a great choice. And I, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain you're the first person to name him as the person you would want to train with. And definitely one of a very small group of people who have even named Enko Itosu on this show, which I find ironic. Uh, because if you know your martial arts lineage, if you know that that Japanese tree trunk mm. of martial arts lineage, he is so important. In fact, we did a research episode on him, uh, episode three twenty one. Oh, okay, that that people can find. And if if you're new to the show at this point, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio dot com. That's where you can find all that. And as we put that together, when I was introducing it, I believe I referred to him as the most important martial artist that virtually no one's ever heard of. Right. Okay. <laughs> because I know so few people who know who he is. And yet you can't deny the influence that he had on so many. Mm, definitely. Yeah. So many of the, uh, the, the, the modern Japanese schools owe something to, to his teachings. Right. Right. And then, of course, any martial arts today, I, I think, you know, you can... You could make an argument for how Japanese martial arts influenced Korean martial arts, and um, yeah, it's it just it's it's a spider web at this point. Anybody who's claiming any true purity, I think, is is probably at least a little misguided. There's there's some cross contamination, at least slightly, from everything to everything else. Definitely, yes, yeah, yeah. Now you brought up competition and the ability to train for competition. That being something that you know, you can do to, to not get bored is, is one of those many options. Is competition something that you're into? Um, it, it, excuse me, it definitely was. Um, and I've competed um, up to kind of European Championship, World Championship level in, in both Kata and Kumite. Um, but when I competed, it was never... Um, with the objective of winning a trophy or becoming a champion or anything like that, I, I always looked at competing as um, another avenue of improving and another opportunity to, to train and to test myself. <clears throat> so that I always looked at, to, if, I, if I were competing and pre preparing for something, to test myself, to see, okay, I, I, can, I can do these techniques in the dojo or I can do these katas in the dojo, but how do they work under pressure when I'm out there on the floor in front of people, in front of judges, facing a competitor I've never seen before? How do things still work? Or, or do they still work? Um, so I enjoyed competing from the perspective of putting myself under that little bit of pressure just to see, 
do my technique still work? Uh, and also the opportunity to, to train with other people and to pit myself against other people who, who are also heading in that direction. So I always saw competition as um, oh, uh, just, just another way of improving, another way of, of, put, of kind of stress testing what I was doing. And along the way, I, I kind of picked up a couple of little tin cups and medals and stuff. And I, I don't even have those anymore. They, they were in an attic in my parents' house and, and they got thrown out or something. I don't know. So that, that was never my, my objective. My objective was always the, the kind of the journey and the experience of competing and what I would get out of that rather than the, the kind of little blue ribbon at the end of the day. Mm. And how has your time competing influenced the way you teach? That's a good question. Um, I think the, again, it, it gives you another opportunity to, to present information to, to students and another opportunity to, to break things down and practice things in another way. So I think whether you're, you're, um, you have a set of techniques and you're, um, you're looking to present them from a self-defense point of view or a competition point of view, they, they all follow very similar principles. In that the principles are going to be the same. You're going to be talking about, you know, creating angles, controlling distance, you know, using feints, you, you're looking for openings and opportunities, using your, your opponent's um, momentum against them and so on. <clears throat> so I think the, the principles are all going to be pretty similar. And, and then having the competition aspect just gives you a little bit more variety to experiment and to play with those, with those principles. So maybe at a slightly different distance or um, with a slightly different dynamic than if it was just two people more statically standing in front of each other. So uh, like we were talking about earlier, it, 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 it gives you um, uh, another option or more variety to, to practice your techniques, another excuse to practice your techniques. Mm. I think there's something pretty magical about competition because it, it allows you to practice all the things that you've been working on. Maybe not all, but quite a few of them in a relatively safe environment, but yet for most of us, something that still gets that heart going. Definitely, yeah. And I, and I think that it is necessary to, <clears throat> to stress test yourself that it's all very, well, all very well when you're in a more comfortable environment in the dojo, but you do need something to, to you know, see, if it, see if the techniques still work when your heartbeat is up. Um, I heard a story about uh, Tiger Woods. I've absolutely no idea if it's true or not. Um, that when he was practicing his putting, what he would do is he would sprint to the green. And then while his heart was still pounding after sprinting to the green, he would then try to execute the put. And he was saying for him, it was the only way in practice that he could replicate putting on the 18th green in front of thousands of people and the stress that that induces. Yeah, so that's, that's, that makes so much sense. Even if it's not true, it should be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's one of those things you really want to be true. Um, so I think, yeah, when you're in the dojo and you're, you're always practicing in a nice, safe environment and you know what's happening next, that's not really, if, you know, even from a self-defense point of view, if you're ever going to have to use your, your, your karate in a real situation, you're, you're going to be under stress. Your heart's going to be pumping. There's going to be an adrenaline dump. And, and how do you replicate that? Well, competition is kind of a, a, a nice way, as you said, in a, in a safe control environment to try to replicate that extra stress that you're going to be under as you're trying to execute those techniques. Right. I think everybody should try it. At least, at least a couple of times. At least once. Do you have any requirement for that? Some schools require... Everyone Absolutely not. No, again, we, I, 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 as you said there, I definitely encourage it because I think it's a, it's a great way of <clears throat> just a... Ex expressing your karate in a different environment, but we don't have any requirements for it, no. Good. Let's kind of shift gears, talk about some, some pop culture stuff. It, you know, it's funny. I think we've gotten pretty deep here and we really haven't talked about Bruce Lee or, or Chuck Norris or yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. movies <laughs> or, or TV or books or anything. And that, that's kind of rare for us to get so deep without the influence of pop culture coming up in the conversation. So sure. Is that part of your martial arts conversation? Do you know what? When it comes to martial arts movies, I like the, the, the old school ones. Um, I'd always go back to the old, um, the old black and white uh, Kurosawa samurai movies. The likes of Seven Samurai, Yojimbo, the ones with uh, Toshiro Mifune. All those kind of 
black and white Japanese ones. They, they're, they're the martial arts movies I, I, I really like. Um, and even moving forward a little bit, one of my favorite ones uh, is a Japanese movie called Zatoichi. Uh, there's a um, bunch of Zatoichi movies. I think this one was in the um, probably the late 1990s. Japanese actor called uh, Takeshi Katano. If you haven't seen it, definitely recommend you you you, you check it out. Um, it's your your typical revenge samurai swordplay movie, but it's got some really really nice little quirky bits in it, and the the end sequence is kind of not what you'd expect. So definitely, if you, if you're looking for a martial arts movie, you like your samurai movies, check out Zatoichi. Um, but yeah, it's kind of the old school ones that I'd prefer rather than I, I, I wouldn't be running out and, you know, checking out the latest Donnie Yen um, movie or anything like that. Okay. Are there any favorite actors? Is, is it, you know, a lot of times the, the older actors were so prolific, you know, turning out movies, you know, some of those, those Shaw brother actors were turning out movies, you know, monthly. Mm. Are there any people that, you know, you found yourself following from one movie to the next? You know, a, a, a little bit. And I, I think probably would be um, Jackie Chan. Mm. And the, the reason I like what he does, it's the, the fight scenes in his movies are so creative. They're, they're you know, really, really athletic, really, really creative. And then when you look at the, the behind the scenes, and you see, especially in his early career, the, the crazy stuff that he was doing just to, to get a shot or to get a stunt and jumping off buildings. It, that was amazing what he was doing. And, and the fact that he still alive, did it all and he's still alive and still going strong. Mm. Yeah, he's... Utterly fantastic, continuing mm. to be fantastic. I mean, he's, I, I'm, I'm not going to get his age exactly right, but late 50s, early 60s at this point, and still showing up and showing up well when he does. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I find that mind blowing. How, how about books? Books, yeah. I think I, probably anybody who um, practices Shotokan, they're, they're going to name. Uh, Dynamic Karate is one of their favorite books by, mm -hmm. by Masatoshi Nakayama. Again, it's kind of an old school, um, mid-1960s when it was first published. But the photographs in the book are absolutely amazing. And they were taken of the, the kind of the young crop of uh, JKA, Japan Karate Association instructors back in the 1960s, all in their prime, all in their 30s. The photography is amazing. It's taken kind of on rooftops across Tokyo or it's taken on, on craggy beaches and they're, they're squaring off against each other. Really, really atmospheric, really all black and white, really kind of broody shots. Um, and a lot of them, some, some of them unfortunately have passed away, but a lot of them are still very active now, kind of into their 70s and, and, and beyond, still very active in the, the, the karate scene. But just, and, and I remember probably my first year and training in karate. I think I got that book out of the library at the start of the summer and just spent the whole summer leafing through the book looking at the pictures in it. Mm. And when I, whenever I look at that book now, it takes me back to like, you know, be, being a white belt or being an orange belt and looking at these pictures and these guys were like total superheroes. So it's a, it's a real nostalgia uh, type of uh, book for me, but the, the, the images in it are fantastic. Um, other books that I think from a, a martial arts per perspective that I think work really well um, and there's two that spring to mind and I like the two of them as a pair because they complement each other really well um, one is called Moving Zen by C.W. Nickel um, and again it's kind of early 1960s he was one of the first foreigners to, to go and train in Japan and uh, the Japan Karate Association um, they started to go there specifically to train in martial arts and obviously being a foreigner in Japan in the 1960s is a whole different experience. But what's interesting about him was that he came from a very physical background. He was an Arctic explorer. He was a professional wrestler. And he admits, you know, he had a, a very short temper. But through his training um, in karate, he, he managed to find his gentler side, his more sedate side. And his, the, the, the intense training managed to, to calm him down. And the subtitle of the book is Karate as a Way to Gentleness. So it's interesting that he came to karate from a very physical and uh, very visceral um, perspective, but his training showed him the flip side of his personality or exposed the flip side of his personality, which was much gentler and much softer. The flip side to that book then is one called um, Angry White Pajamas, which is a, 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 yes. a, a, have you come across it? I have. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, and again, it's the flip side in that the, the author is, um, 
is much more academic. He's living in Tokyo. He's um, a writer. He's earning a living teaching English. He realizes he's totally out of shape. He wants to get in shape. He's in Japan. I'll do a martial art. And he trains, starts training in Aikido. And he, the, the Aikido club that he's training in happens to be where the Tokyo Riot Police do their intensive one-year training course. So he falls into this um, uh, Aikido course, which is very, very intense, very, very aggressive, very robust. And it's through his training in Aikido, he finds his, his physical side and his physical expression. So even though he starts off approaching martial arts from a very academic perspective, through Aikido, he finds his, his physical side and his physical expression versus uh, C.W. Nickel, who approached martial arts from that very physical side and through his training, he found his, the flip side of that. He found his, his gentle side. So mm -hmm. I think that's nice in that when you approach martial arts, very often it'll, it'll bring out um, parts of your personality that maybe need bringing out or that, that you haven't explored. I agree. And, and I think this comes back to, you know, we, we talked about it in a couple of different times and use slightly different language for it, but this idea that martial arts gives so much back to you based on what you put in and martial arts ability to find what you need. And if you're willing to listen. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and just, I think there, there are two little books that kind of very simple reads, not very complicated. They're kind of written decades apart, but I think as a, as a set, they work really, really well in explaining how martial arts, as you said, can, can bring out that part of your personality that, that, maybe you haven't explored previously. Mm, I agree. Let's talk about the future. You know, here you are, you're you've been <laughs> training a while. You're still training. You know, clearly you're, you're still engaged. You're still interested. You know, you were willing to give your time to come on this show. So that tells me that martial arts is still a very important part of your life, which begs the question, why? Why after all this time, are you still fired up? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And, you know, Possibly, um, it's because I'm afraid of what will happen if I stop. Mm. Um, and, and that's kind of a negative reason to continue training. But I think there's a, there's a little bit of a, a grain of that. And, you know, you asked me what would I be doing if I, if I weren't training, and I'm not sure. So I'm not sure what would happen to, to me either in terms physically or personality-wise if I, if I stopped. You know, that might be, um, that might be a, little bit, uh, a little bit scary. But I, I think one of the reasons, apart from that kind of slightly negative incentive, one, one of the reasons is that I'm, I'm always looking for a way to improve. And martial arts and karate, I think it offers you that. I, no matter how long you're training, there's always going to be something you can tweak. There's always going to be something that you can, you can change or something you can improve. Or, or you, you watch somebody else doing something, even if it's not karate, if it's some other physical activity, and you're going, oh, I need a little bit of that in what I'm doing. So there's always going to be that that um, the, the, the Kaizen, the continuous incremental improvement. So there's always going to be an opportunity to, to be a little bit better. And then, as you said, looking look to the future, you're kind of going, well, in a year's time, if I'm focusing on this, you know, what, what can I be doing better? What do I need to be doing better in a year's time? And how am I, how am I going to address that? So like I was saying at the, uh, you know, at the, the beginning, one of the reasons that I, I continued training beyond the first few classes was because I realized that there was a, a real pathway to improvement and a real color correlation between, you know, hey, you train, you get better. So I think it's that feeling of, hey, if I keep training, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep getting better. I'm going to keep improving. And as you get a little bit older and your body <clears throat> inevitably starts to, to, to give out in different places, then it becomes more challenging. You have to find out, okay, well, I'm a little bit stiff and a little bit sore, but there's still somewhere where I can improve. I can't just go, oh, I'm stiff, I'm sore. That's it. No, job's done. Day's over. <laughs> <laughs> You have to be able to say, okay, I'm a little bit sore, a little bit stiff, but yeah, I can still keep working. I can still keep improving in other areas. So it's that constant challenge, I think, keeps me coming back. I think one of the things that I find most fascinating and simultaneously frustrating is that as we keep progressing, and we keep learning, it becomes harder and harder to stay skilled at all of the things that we're learning. Definitely, yeah. The, the, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> oh. It, it, it is a beautiful and painful realization. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially for someone like, like myself. And, and I don't know if you're one of these folks who like checking off boxes. Oh, I know this. I've got this. I've done this. Yeah, I think in, in, <laughs> in, in, in martial arts, it's more difficult to do that. It's very diff difficult to say, yeah, 
definitely, I've got this. Don't have to do it again. It's done. There's always, you know, when you return to it, because you've gained a little bit of experience somewhere else, you, you go back to something you thought you knew and you realize, oh, hold on, there's a whole area I haven't explored here. So I think when you, when you start to improve in one area, you see the potential for, for improvement, improvements in other areas. And that goes back to what you were saying about, you know, training and competition. Sometimes that opens up areas of improvement in non-competitive aspects of the art. But you suddenly realize there's improvements there because you go, well, hold on, when I was competing, I was, uh, I was able to move this way, or I was able to move a little bit faster, or I was able to use these angles. Now I have to use the same angles and speed and whatever else in, in this other area of my training. Definitely. Now, if people have been listening and, you know, maybe they're, they're interested in, in stopping by, maybe taking, taking a class with you or, or, or jumping in, maybe they're on vacation, or they just want to reach out and say, thank you or hello, follow you on social media, you know, any of that, how would people find you online? Sure. Um, on me personally, the best way to reach out is probably go through Twitter or Instagram. I'm old boy karate, O-L-D-B-O-Y karate. Um, so yeah, happy to, to chat with anybody. Um, if you want to train with our group or, or any other clubs, or you know, we we do we get a lot of um, a lot of visitors, a lot of tourists passing through the city, and they bring their karate gi with them on holidays for some unknown reason, and they come down and join us for a couple of classes. If you go onto Facebook and look for a uh, JKA Shotokan Ireland, you'll you'll find our groups. You can you can ask us a question there, and somebody else, somebody will get back to you. Um, and then also I take classes in Dublin City University and DCU. And so again, on Facebook, DCU Karate or DCUKarate.com, and any of those will, will, will get through to us. Nice. And of oh, course, and we'll, we'll, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Sorry, sorry. And one, one other thing, sorry, I, I mentioned, I also write for a magazine called Shotokan Karate Magazine. Um, so I, I've written a, a bunch of articles about different things. So if anybody's interested in, in kind of hearing about my, my opinions about kata or training or, or you know, training as you're getting older or what, what, whatever else I happen to be writing about, Shotokan Karate Magazine um, is where I, I publish some of my articles. Cool. And of course, folks, we're going to link all that, all the, that stuff, the, the ways to get a hold of Sensei on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I thank you for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Learned a lot. You, you, you've got me wanting to go train, which is going to be difficult because I've got another interview right away. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a catch-22 there. But before I do let you go, if I could ask you for one more thing, and that's what parting words would you give to everyone listening today? Sure. Um, first piece of advice, I guess, would be um, don't look to people like me for advice. <laughs> <laughs> But if you're here and you're listening, um, I think just to, to go back to, you know, what I said when um, we were talking about Bushido and what it means and, and what you can take from your martial arts into other aspects of your life, whatever you're doing, try to uh, give it 100 percent, even though it's becoming increasingly difficult with so many distractions, or, you know, in the, the, the world that we live in now. But I think if, if you can just kind of focus on, on giving that whatever it is you're doing or whoever it is you're talking to, give them that 100 percent, you can't go far wrong. A lot of the people that we have on the show check this box for being perpetual students. There's a humility, there's a confidence in what they do, but a recognition that there's so much more to know, in fact, more than they ever will know. And I think that's a pretty apt description for Sensei Murphy. His love of karate doesn't blind him from the fact that he's part of it. It's not something he's going to ever grab all of. It's something that is going to keep him fueled, driving forward, working to get better. And that was the thing that stuck out most for me. And it's something that I admire and I really try to cultivate myself. Hopefully all of you do as well. So thank you so much, sir. I appreciate your time on the show. If you want to check out the show notes, we've got photos, links, transcript, all that, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Podcast 15 gets you 15% on every single product at whistlekick.com uniforms, sparring gear. We're rolling out new products all the time. So if you haven't checked out that website, check it out soon. You can also find our stuff on Amazon, but Amazon takes a good chunk. So no extra discount there. If you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And you can follow us on social media at whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Our Instagram account's been blown up lately. Not sure why, but thank you to those of you that are following us and commenting. That's all I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.